Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our Creating Creepy Creatures panel. Um, sorry for the little delay off the top, but we're very happy to have you all here with us. And so we're going to be going through, this is going to be a kind of an informal conversation. So feel free to submit um, questions into the Q&A and into the chat, and we'll try to get to them. Um, but just so you guys know, um, I'm Nicole Hendricks. I'm the co-founder of the Consport Association with Rachel Minerding. And part of the reason that I wanted to start this with um, Rachel is because Neville and I actually had a really interesting conversation um, a couple of years ago and just realized that there wasn't really a space um, for concept artists to be recognized solely for the work that they're doing in their part of the entertainment industry pipeline. And um, with that said, I just wanted to talk about Neville. Neville, if you could tell us a little bit about um, who you are and what you, um, how you, what you do in the industry. Sure. Uh First, thank you so much for having me. It's a real privilege to be associated and be amongst these giants here. Just seeing that little video clip is a reminder of what a privilege it is to work with you guys. And uh, I think I've worked with most of you. Um, but uh, my background is industrial design. Actually, I went to the Art Center College of Design and studied product design. And that has lent itself, uh, that education has lent itself to um, a, a unique approach to uh, design in the entertainment industry because my background was specifically in terms of working in the industry as an industrial designer, medical products, uh, oxygen therapy, ambulatory aids for the disabled, um, sporting goods, and protective gear. And What's so interesting to me is how all of that I've used um, as a designer, concept designer in film. I'm probably best known for creature design. Ironically, that's not what I do um, the most. Um, but again, it's a privileged industry to be a part of. Uh, and I love growing and being motivated. And the, the group of um, artists on this panel um, if you're calling it a panel, are a huge inspiration to me. And I aspire to get a little bit as good as they are. It's, it's truly a delight, guys. Thank you. And Terrell, would you want to tell us a little bit about you? Um, my, I think I could echo what Neville has said. I feel very, very honored um, to be included in this group. Yes. <laughs> My background is basically in the sciences. I majored in vertebrate zoology, um, special interest in vertebrate paleontology, and had never intended to go into the industry. I never intended to be a creature designer. I sort of fell into it by accident. I was I had every intent to be a natural history illustrator and work for National Geographic and Smithsonian and other other things. I do do a lot of work. In that, in that particular discipline, I do a lot of that, paleo reconstruction in particular. But I sort of fell into it by accident. Um, I was just in the right place at the right time. And, uh, and that's what happened with me. <laughs> so uh, my background, again, is in um, natural history. And with very little art school, I don't have it. 
Thank you, Terrell. I love your perspective because it's such a different perspective than a lot of, um, you know, the, the artists that we're typically talking to. So it's awesome to have you here. Thank you. And then Jared and Anthony, um, you guys obviously have known each other for a very long time. Um, Jared, if you wanted to kind of yeah. kick it off. <laughs> In terms of the relationship with Anthony, for instance? Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've known him since he was 13. That's yeah. where we met. <laughs> wow. Completely unrelated creatures. How do you guys know each other? This is <laughs> <laughs> the journey. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How do you know each yeah. other? Yeah. Uh, Associates of Art. Yeah, we, we went to a school in Van Nuys called Associates in Art. I was uh, 13, and I think Anthony just got out of the... Uh, the Navy. The Navy. I was going to say military. Yeah. Navy. And um, yeah, we, we ended up taking the same class together. And then... Uh, Actually, no, I didn't take a class with you. I just met you in one of the classes that I was sneaking into. So and then I met you. Into that class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were you like 14 in the Navy, Anthony? What's going on? No. <laughs> no, I was, I was already 22 when I met him. 23. So, uh, but he's like, you know, a, a child prodigy. You know, very good. His art and craft. No air quotes. He's a child prodigy. <laughs> yeah, uh, I meant. <laughs> like he thinks he was a child prodigy. Yeah. <laughs> That's how he introduced himself. <laughs> yeah. I, Jared. I'm, I'm Jared. Jared Morantz. He just always introduces his whole name to me all the time, even though I know him already. No, just kidding. He's <laughs> still to this day. Yeah. Jared Morantz. He's the shy party. kid. <laughs> <laughs> Not accurate. No. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's that's how we that's how we met. And actually, I owe Anthony um, quite a bit because uh, we we you know we parted ways. We didn't you know um, take each other's phone numbers or anything. And then uh, we ran into each other at a uh, lecture that Justin Sweet was uh, doing a while back, out of, out of nowhere, <clears throat> and uh, immediately reconnected. So I was at Art Center at the time. And Anthony was actually able to skip, you know, paying tuition or whatever, like he found a way to just start working. Um, but I did it the hard way and I went to school and I got into debt. And um, uh, while I was at Art Center, we, we reconnected and then I got out of school and I started uh, doing the practical effects houses, which a lot of a lot of guys end up doing. We just jump from like house to house. And then there was the uh, writer strike and we were still in contact and Anthony had broken through into video games. And he wanted me to um, to kind of take his place at a company called NCSoft a while ago, and it was yeah, a really yeah. He didn't know gig. he didn't know I was leaving it. I just wanted him to come and yeah. you know work for us. And as soon as he came over, I, I had an opportunity to leave. But um, but, but you, the, the you were there when we remember when we reconnected again when, when you were still going to school. He I, I didn't go to school there or anything, but um. But yeah, I helped with a little bit of your projects just because yeah, yeah, yeah. his teammates weren't there for him. So I was like, oh, maybe I could do something with you. you That's know, right. So. Did, um, I, I, was, I was pitching my own project and uh, Anthony uh, came in and he did a couple of characters for me and it was, it was just awesome. So that was actually probably yeah. our first collaboration right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then later on, we got to collaborate on a game called uh, Tabla Rasa at NCSoft. Oh, yeah. and that was, that was a very useful experience for me because I had only jumped from, you know, practical effects houses. And Anthony handed me a real job, which I was never <laughs> used to. So it was like, really. He's already too good. So he has one of my that, choices for that. that was, but yeah, I love this guy. Basically. Yeah, so I got to learn from Anthony. Um, he, he taught me uh, Photoshop along with a bunch of other guys that I was privileged enough to sit next to, like Kevin Chen, Hong Lee, John. Steve Messing. Messing was gone before me. He, he bailed. Oh, was he gone already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve yeah. was there, uh, Kang was there. Before yeah, me. Was like a yeah. bunch of us. A lot of the good ones left before me, but I still <laughs> had Anthony. I still had Anthony. Um, and, uh, and then yeah soft dissolved and uh, oh and then we started working together again at uh, marvel gardens of the galaxy yeah that's the first project we were both on for marvel yeah. so we, we had a chance to do all uh, as much of the creatures we could could do and the background aliens and learned a lot yeah you know, doing that we were we, we were so excited we worked late nights just me and him till one yeah. in the morning yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i asked really, you guys well, of course Ryan was still there 
Of course. Um, and I do ask you guys that question to illustrate that one of, in my opinion, one of the most important things in the industry is to be kind to each other because yeah, you're going to yeah. be with each other for a long time. Um, or to have giving friends is very yes. important. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have yeah. to add that I forgot to add though, like, you know, thank you again for having me here with, you know, all these legendary guys over here. I mean, I just have to say Terrell, seeing your stuff in Star Wars, of yeah. course, Inspiration, Neville, your first uh, uh, what, Noman video <laughs> with the cheetah or, or, or hyena, mm -hmm. I think. I've watched that. So just, just, to, just to say, you know, I, I've, I've learned so much too, just watching you guys, you know, as I, as I went up in my career. So, yeah. <laughs> well, and um, Jared, just going back to you really quick. Um, so for people coming on that maybe have not heard of you, like what, um, how would you define yourself within the industry? Um, I do, I do creature design and uh, costume. And um, I've been, I've been very fortunate and have been able to work on, on a lot of uh, really fun projects with a lot of very talented people. Um, I spent a lot of time at Marvel with, with Anthony, obviously I, I bounce around, I'll, I'll work on, you know, some Warner Brothers superhero films and, um, and, you know, just a lot of monsters, anything, are we being specific or? No, that was, that was no, lovely. Thank you. Okay. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and same question to you, Anthony. Like horror, horror stuff. Yeah. Uh, when I started, first started my career, it was all just monster stuff, horror, Mostly, I wanted to get into just doing horror film creatures. And uh, when I went to Associates, that's when I met Jordu and I realized oh, there's such a thing as a creature designer. I didn't know that. I just wanted to go work for Star Wars stuff, but I, I didn't know exactly what that meant. Uh, but uh, um, started off with that. And at Marvel, you know, finally, after 20 years, you know, eight years at Marvel, um, I found a really good group of guys that, you know, kind of called home kind of uh, and, and then I started just doing more than just creature stuff so I do characters now costume design stuff and my most notable thing that I'm, I'm proud of designing is Baby Groot so I got to do that guy so and then that kind of helped me um, gain more of a like a like a voice in in the design world and just more interviews and trying to help other people to, you know try to get better with their art and stuff so uh, yeah, so I'm happy, you know, to to be part of this group and hopefully get to inspire more people. Thank you, Anthony. And last but surely not least, Bryn. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. Thanks for thanks for having me. My gosh, I'm just really super uh, honored to be among all of you, echoing the same thing. Of course, a lot of gratitude, and um, it's very humbling to be able to get to sit here with you all, even if it's virtually. Um, but yeah, so I uh, also specialize in creature design. My background started in publishing. I was working a lot for RPGs and card games, Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons, notably. Um, but I have jumped into film recently and been working in that ever since. So, um, you know, been working on some really cool projects lately, Men in Black, Ghostbusters, all kinds of fun stuff. So, um, but yeah, most of my stuff is is all creature based. Um, <laughs> that's I much think it was the Magic is. the Gathering stuff that I first saw your work. Oh, it's from Magic. Cool. Because awesome. I, I was yeah. addicted to playing that game yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> it's really it's really fun. Um, it was a really cool project to be on, and um, it's a it's dear to my heart. Those yeah. Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> so. Yeah, we should play someday again. It's that been would be years cool. though. <laughs> Yeah, same. I used to play all the time, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my decks are like hiding in a drawer somewhere. Yeah. Waiting. <laughs> my husband and I so. play a lot of games, but that's when we stay away from because that's like a, that's a financial commitment. That's <laughs> <is>. careful. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we, yeah. We do a lot of D&D &D instead. Um, oh, but, yeah. I love D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. So good. Um, could go on a long D&D &D tangent, but we won't because we're here to talk <laughs> about creepy creatures. So first question for the group, um, is there a specific creature throughout games, film, history, current, that to you is just an iconically creepy creature and why? Anyone want to jump in? 
I don't think any of us have any idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> no nothing. What did you iconic watch over and over again? Yeah. What about your favorite one? We, don't, we can remove the word iconic. Iconic can. Yeah, also like kind of think that you see, you know, if you've seen a creature from like film or TV, and you're like, oh man, I wish oh. I had designed that. That's so cool. This one. I have this oh, one. I'd probably say when I was still living in the Philippines and, you know, I was 14, I think, or 15, and I watched Aliens the first time. And, you know, that's, what, whoa, this alien, you know, is amazing. And, and, then, and, then I, and then I watched Alien, and that's when I'm like, wow, this is, this horror film is, you know, I've never seen something made that way and made me scared that way. Um, but uh, but that, that to me is pretty iconic and Predator, of course, but there's, a, there's more stuff now. That, uh, that I like, uh, but that is really, you know, sticks to me for a long time. So I watch it like over and over again while I do my homework or something. <laughs> That's what I would do before. And Star Wars and Back to the Future and Indiana Jones. Those were the three. <laughs> what about I feel, yeah, I feel like, oh, go ahead. I'm uh, sure. Oh, I feel like Alien is, is absolutely one of my top picks but I think one that I watched recently that I really appreciate the design in is the Graboid from Tremors. Mm. I really love that creature. <laughs> yeah Tremors. I think it's so it's so clever in a lot of the ways that it it works. Um, beak design like the little Graboids that come out with like it's like reversed hooks that can help grab prey and bring <laughs> it into the mouth. There was actually a lot of thought put into that creature and I don't know. I really, I really think it's kind of a unique thing. You don't see like a blob monster too often, you know. So I really like the graboids. It might be one of my top picks, of course, after the xenomorph from Alien, because yeah. I love that alien so much. Yes. I was going to say, yeah. if uh, a a bar for selecting uh, is trauma, for me. The, <laughs> The two, which are almost not creature in a way, but um, Exorcist and Joe. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it was a time when I was, I was very young, um, 11 or 12, maybe. And um, I wasn't a prodigy at that point. <laughs> at any point. But we're, gonna, we're always going to go back to that joke. Yeah. <laughs> but I just remember how, how much those two films uh, affected me bothered me, you know, to the point of, uh, like everyone, couldn't go in the water, and by water, any water, bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And th what was scarier was the exorcist, more than any monster, because monsters, you kind of sort of knew that they were made up, but a possessed human by the devil, uh, if you were gullible enough to believe in it, <clears throat> that messed me up it still does you know that that piano music uh when you hear it the trauma comes right back and that i found to be a very important reference for me in regards to trying to create um emotive emotionally impactful designs is what is it about those that that messed me up and hundreds of thousands if not millions of other people it's, it's a good study, if not just, you know, uh, when you're laying in bed at night, to just wonder what is it about those two creatures that are so effective? I, I think I would have to agree with Neville. Um, I think one of the things that made the xenomorph um, so effective was what you didn't see. It was the build-up to that. It was very Hitchcocky in that, in that regard. And of course, the design when you did see it, when you did see the movie, it was wonderful. It's like this dinosaur skeleton and made it with a plain mantis. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty darn cool. I would say that, um, as far as, it's not quite really a creature, but like the devil you were saying, it's that spiritual spookiness that uh, the recent remake of uh, the um, haunting of um, Hill House, the Ghost that was the tall, thin, attenuated entity in this Victorian suit. That was so frightening. These are things oh, that see this is like somebody to come into your room and haunt you. That was, that was very, 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 very fascinating and, and, and 
takes a lot to scare me as far as horror movies go to. Oh, I know how to do that. Oh, look at that effect. You know, we do this for me. I just work on that. Whatever. But I, as a child, my mother was very, very um, liberal on that. She allowed me, and this is in the 1960s, and I was a six year old kid that started <laughs> Dark Shadows at four in the afternoon. And that was all about what we didn't see. It was not obviously vampires and stuff. But it was more of that eerie spookiness that gets me in the spirit with people. Yeah, definitely. I need to watch The Haunting. Is that the one on Netflix right now? Yeah. It's so yeah, good. I gotta see it. It's so, beautiful. I gotta see it. Is it just because you mentioned something like scary, like spiritual kind of spirit, go scary. The one that really affected me recently, and not the fact, like I love it. I love getting scared. I, I, I like a, um, Hereditary. Have you seen that? I was like, man. Yeah, not really monsters, though. Not monsters. You're right. Yeah, it's not monsters. And yeah, this is the same thing with Exorcist. Um, they have they have that impact. Mine was, uh, I think, Silence of the Lambs and Frankenstein. Uh, those got me when I was a kid. And again, you know, not monsters. But I wasn't allowed to see R-rated films until until I was able to guilt my parents into it. So I think I might have been like like uh, 21. 14, 15, close. Close. Uh, so those those films those films got me, um, you know, for a while. But it, it is interesting. Like the more creature you go, um, the harder it is to actually impact an audience. And I think that's why Alien was actually so successful because it was treated like a horror film, and there wasn't a full reveal on a monster. And uh, that, that I think played a lot into why the film is so well, um, why it's lasted so long, why it's had so much impact and why it's genuinely terrified people. I, aside from that, I can't really think of a, of a creature that's genuinely terrified people. Oh, we know it just like, popped in my head. No. It's alive. It's what? It's alive. It's alive. Rick Baker. Yeah. Early 70s, I think. Uh, basically a demon baby uh -huh. oh my god yeah right i'm gonna turn my lights up yeah people are dropping oh, some um some in the chat here uh the llama oh. creature from color out of space <laughs> that that was pretty cool. oh yeah the thing that was actually really you know, big. Because because kind of the troopers. yeah yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The that's relic. a great design <laughs> it is a good design yeah yeah Which well, now that we've kind of brainstormed a lot of these creepy creatures, um, can we talk about what, just in general, when you're designing a creature and you're wanting it to be scary or unsettling, what are some kind of design elements that you incorporate or that you would recommend? Well, for, you know, something unsettling, uh, depending on how you want to hit the audience, uh, for some reason, leaning into uh, human always goes uh, unsettling. So no matter what the base is, if it's gotta be like a crazy spider thing or, or, or whatever, if there's a way to ground it um, in the face, something that emotes and something that's um, relatable, that seems to be like a good trick to make it genuinely frightening is to make it, um, make it more human. You know, what I tried, I think what I tried to do before was look through what their the phobias, and I know arachnophobia was one of the things that would the creepy crawlers, you know, feel it on their skin. So it kind of used that psychological effect on people. And then when I did that spider Filipino folklore spider creature, I did before I tried to include some of that shape language just so it reminds people of a spider, and maybe that kind of scares them. Because spider didn't scare me, like I don't scare easy like Terrell, right? I don't really quite scare easily when I was younger. I watched a, a lot of horror films as much as I can, as soon as we had that Betamax every night, I would, you know, um, uh, but, but I never thought of, of what other people are scared of. So when I had my girlfriend and started meeting girls and stuff, most of them are scared of spiders. Yeah, they would tell me that. and. Oh, maybe I could use that as as a starting point to to kind of try to scare people. And there's a lot of other ways you could use that uh, psyche of people to turn it against them. 
I, I think that kind of goes into some of like what we expect from like faces. And I think that playing with the like placement of eyes and mouths and the arrangement of the face can be really alarming because um, humans kind of have like an expectation of what they're going to see in a face. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why insects and alien and all these creatures can be kind of unsettling to us because we don't know where the eyes are and we don't know what they're thinking. Uh, yeah, they and so it up. makes us, <laughs> sorry? They played with that in Mimic. Yes. Mm, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a that's a great creature. That also. is a good really one. Like the creatures in Mimic. In Mimic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think the um, you know something to do with that is something that I'll try to to push a lot, um, just to pull the eyes apart or mess with something in the anatomy or the or the the face or whatever it is, whether it's human or more animalistic, can really kind of jar the audience a bit to. Like, yeah. oh wait, that wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like Pan's <laughs> Labyrinth. Speaking yeah, of yeah. What one thing that I've kind of found myself trying to do more and more lately, um, going with Anthony, what you said about the primal, you know, tapping into the primal fears. Um, when it's performance for me, and the reason why I say that is because of the expectation of an audience. Um, and trying to scare people, uh, we can go with the primal fear. We, you know, those are the bases that we know work. Um, yeah. But if you were to say, like, who is the scariest person? Um, <laughs> it's not about looks so much. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most frightening human beings on the planet, was. Um, yeah. And you think of these serial killers that do despicable things. They're not bad looking people. They don't have a scar running through an eye and a cataract and they're not, you know, going to pencil mustache um so what i find and, and take a look at a creature a dolphin who always looks like it's smiling or when a dog is panting there's kind of a smile that's not what is happening so i find that that expectation to be a very valuable thing and performance um to be kind of the new realm to try because we're the designers responding to the scripts, responding to the narrative. So tr if you can have a dialogue with the writers or the directors, producers and say, hey, what about including some very unusual performance of a creature? It's a benign looking creature. It doesn't have the furrowed brow and giant fangs. It looks pretty, um, pretty uh, complacent. But what it does and how it goes about doing it is the scary stuff. But that's performance. And we, as designers, seldom get to sit down with animation and say, it goes like this. You know, we just kind of hand over a creature and then we see it moving. It's like, oh, it's not how it <laughs> moves. You, you've animated some stuff, right, Neville? Like, you did some tests. Yeah, I, I try to. Um, and at the very least, I really try and wedge myself into the production, even for free, dare I say, because um, mm -hmm. they're not going to pay for you to stick around and talk about your designs. But, you know, to say I'm available for a phone call to talk to the animators. Um, and I, I got to spend time on Super 8, for example, with Bruce Greenwood um, and with the animators at ILM talking about how the creature is because you know I, I don't say this with any arrogance at all but we we're given the seeds to create um, but we ultimately are the ones who are the most invested typically in a creature so we know what it's supposed to sound like what it smells like but yet we are the ones that are never included in the performance which is really um, an unfortunate missing link and that was part of my plight in my conversation with you, Nicole, a couple of years ago. It's like, we, we are a service that can, it is so much more than just a drawing of something with gnashing teeth. Uh, take advantage of us in a different way. I'm fairly um, fortunate as far as working with Lucasfilm, or working actually directly with George Lucas, in that he um, gave us our as the conceptual artist for the Phantom Menace and the, and the first part of the, um, that first, that, that prequel um, trilogy. Uh, I was able to do some cell animation as far as how Jar Jar walked, how, how Sebulba moved, the old fashioned cell mm -hmm. 
also regarding clean a scary clean. And of course with Star Wars, you're looking at an audience that is children, so you don't want to freak kids out too much. But still there has to be some scary element mm-hmm. in it. And so we did lot, there was a lot of discussion that we had with George um, about different films, filmmakers he admired, effects he wanted to do. And so when I was working on the Son of Aqua Monster, the, the giant, big underwater creature, um, we thought a lot about apocalypse now. And one of the most frightening parts of that movie was when you have the the eyes in the jungle and then with the guns, you're isolated. And the jungle is oppressive. It's oppressive. You talk about small spaces. And they hear the snap and the crackle around it. And they have their guns and they just hang it for you on. But it's not. Also, it's a tiger. And everybody jumps in the theater. And so with the Sando monster, I said, I'm going to design a tiger. And that's where that came from. And so be able to actually have some more investment in motion and how the animal, the um, the animal, move, how it thought, and such. That was some of those really important, very rare occurrences we working with the film with George. And it was, it was kind of a one in a lifetime experience. That was cool. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That's awesome. I love, I love all this. Um, I, I truly like looking at how all of you, um, just obviously except going through your work, you know, preparing for this panel. And I, I love the way that you really do incorporate like the biological, like all these creatures, you're drawing them the way that we're used to seeing them in like a scientific book. Um, are there specific, I'm just going to one of the questions in our Q and A. Um, are there specific biologists or paleontologists whose research um, has inspired you um, in your creature creation? I'm thinking to myself, when my three years, ever since I was a little, little girl, I was a gay naturalist who did this exquisitely beautiful girls and sisters and this patient um, of semi-zoic mammals. And I just loved, loved it. So that's exactly what I did. Um, that's why I went on that path to become a I wanted to be able to do animals, real animals, and prehistoric animals to the best of my ability. And so I went to the journey of understanding anatomy, animal behavior, and I love doing a lot of animals. Animals are the most challenging, real animals are the most challenging any creature to draw because a tiger, a horse, an elephant will tell you exactly how badly you do it. You have imaginary animals, you don't have peers in nature. But real animals do. And so, looking at the work of these of, of a great paleo illustrator like Dave Athernitz, um, just blew me out, just blew me away. And I look to artists that inspired me the most, like Pop Wild Life, like Bob Queen, for example. Um, those are who inspired me. I look to them because, and to look at real animals. When you look at real animals, they inform anything that comes out of them. You can't do better than look at the aliens that like, share our plans with us. Thank you. Um, is there any way you could type the names of those specific people in the chat when you get a second? Um, thank you. And then do um, Neville, Jared, anyone else, do you have any specific um, biologists or paleontologists? Or when you're looking at reference, is it scientific in nature or is it just kind of all over the place in terms of where you're pulling from or um for me it's all over the, it's a google image search and uh elliot goldfinger's um animal anatomy for artists usually and uh it's a good broad um map for um for anatomy because you know amongst mammals there aren't that many changes it you know it's a different configurations it's, it's stretched over different proportions um but that'll usually get me through it. I tend to be, uh, my, my process has unfortunately been so fast paced that, uh, that's, that those are my go-to. So it's, it's, it's Google and animal anatomy for artists. Um, that, that's it, at least, at least at first. And then, um, 
finding interesting combinations of, of words for Google images and, and stuff. Like just typing in weird uh, animals. Um, like if I have to brainstorm, then it's, it's, it's a, a big <clears throat> Google image results of just weird animals. And then I'll usually just start creating collages and then sketching from that. I actually like to also watch a lot of um, documentaries. I, I like watching a lot of like microbiology documentaries oh, yeah. or yeah, even just like the ocean, the coral reef documentaries just playing in the background. But when I was younger, I watched a lot of those already. So it kind of helps uh, with just all the visual uh, li uh, uh, library that I would have. Um, I think my favorite recently was, was uh, Octopus. I've been watching a lot of Octopus stuff. <laughs> You know, I've always loved octopuses, but just the way I always am fascinated with the way their gills work, you know, where it, it lets in uh, the water in one side and like a little tube that pushes on the other end. And it's just like, wow, I wonder I how that would look like on me. I'm kind of curious. <laughs> so you, you mentioned octopuses, like you guys design creatures that are not necessarily real. Like, what do you think are some of the kind of creepiest um creatures, animals that are already kind of out in the world. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, microscopic. If talking, yeah, like, if you're talking like octopuses, like, yeah, you know, and, um, you know, Neville was kind of saying about like dolphins being like kind of creepy. <laughs> that they're just kind of like, dolphins are creepy. They're just yeah. kind of like, hey, just like, <laughs> no, n there's like no emotion there. And you're like, what are they thinking? Um, <laughs> Isn't there a Simpsons episode or something where like the dolphins like take over the world? Like, is it Simpsons or like Family, family Guy? Guy? Is it family, family Guy? Family Guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's like all these dolphins that like take over. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, I feel like, yeah, natural, the natural world is a pretty good place to start with. Um, mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. When I was younger, mosquitoes look really creepy to me. You know, <laughs> have a microscope, look at their faces. It's just so, oh man. I have yet to create anything more interesting than stuff that already exists. Like, it, like it's truly alien, like microscopic organisms, deep sea stuff. Can't beat it. Yeah. Stuff can't beat it. You know, yeah, water the, bear, right? That one. Yeah, yeah. A very expensive tool, um, but if you're serious about it, uh, I would strongly suggest a microscope. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's, you don't have to go crazy. I would love an electron microscope. Yeah. That's crazy. But I have a couple microscopes that magnify, uh, and they're binocular too, which gives you a, a beautiful sense of depth. And it's incredible, the detail, if you're looking for textures and so on. And the one thing that I find so fascinating about uh, microscopic viewing is your change in perspective of respect, because you see the complexity um, that's beyond mammalian and human and you see ants and these incredible um hinged mechanisms that is yeah. their limbs and these textures that are so tiny and precise and purposeful and deliberate um via evolution and that to me is a wonderful resource visually an incredible education but i think with a punctuation at the end of this it's vital for the respect of all living things. You no longer, you should no longer, just step on an ant because it's walking in your way. Yeah. You should you know, get a piece of paper, coax it along there and blow it off. Yeah. The garden. Uh, and if you, if you, if that's not something that occurs to you, it's probably because you haven't seen it up close and intimate yeah. and personal. Jumping on that one, it just reminded me on Ant-Man, when you worked on it, I, I helped design the ants for it. Mm -hmm. And I watched so many documentaries about ants, and I didn't know that, you know, the whole ant colony was mainly female. And and only the males were there for one reason, and they, they die right after that. So <laughs> that and they, yeah, <laughs> that's why they keep everything organized, you know. Um, and some of the ants, which is very, you know, like, like, I don't know if you could even make this up, but it's happened in real life where some of the ants would fill themselves up with, you know, with honey, sugar, water for the winter. And then a row of ants would come in and it would regurgitate the sugar water out and they would feed themselves that way. And I could imagine like, what if, 
people were up hanging on that and they expanded their bodies. You know, that kind of stuff comes through my mind. There'd Just be a lot of that. losers is what <laughs> going on. I wouldn't want to win. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, the, the ant stuff is uh, just new appreciation for how all these ants look like, the bullet ant, the crazy ants, and the red ants, all, all that stuff is amazing. So I feel like we're scientists sometimes, you know, just researching this stuff and just getting... Um, what, what's, that, what's that parasite that uh, uh, grows inside of, of uh, small, like ants, and oh, then, like burst through? The what fungus? Is that goes yeah, into think, ants and then they have to go up to the top of the tree or something to the receive workers, right yeah yeah nature is terrifying it's absolutely it is. horrifying and cruel just you know with us even out of the equation yeah <laughs> the hornets is a hornets that lay eggs on bees the bees bring it back to their colony it's, it's getting eaten inside from the inside yeah no there's nothing there's nothing more terrifying <laughs> you can't you can't beat nature never oh man well, and just kind of expanding that out, um, I guess, and maybe starting it off with Bryn. Um, so just in general, like, do you, where from, do you get inspiration? Like, if you're wanting to create a creature, like, what's your process if you're wanting to get inspired on it to create a specific thing? Well, I'm, well, if it's, you know, I'm for script, project, that sort of thing, I'll usually look there first to kind of see what sort of guidelines I'm given, because a lot of times there's some sort of idea in mind. It kind of depends. Um, for some projects, there's definitely been, like, this character looks like this or this creature has this going on and that kind of thing and so I have to sort of piece together um, clues from the writing and the director and the team and find reference and material to work from starting there. Other times um, it's been a little more like we just need alien pets so go wild so I just kind of jump in and go crazy. Um, you know I try to think of things that might re that the audience might relate to in terms of signifiers so types of characters like we kind of typically assign roles to certain types of animals um you know something that's cute and fuzzy and round was probably going to be associated with friendliness as opposed to something that's like an octopus might be kind of mysterious or you know alien so these kinds of things can be used to make characters that have a particular appeal for the audience. Um, so I'm really trying, I'm actually really thinking about my audience a lot and sort of what their, what the experience is supposed to be. Um, Can I ask is it you going to be a scary experience? Is it? Sure. Yeah. That's what you're just saying. And this goes for yeah. all of them. Um, yeah. I've, yeah, I feel bad for certain animals that have just been given a bad <laughs> rap, like bats, for example, you know, totally. you look at a bat, Bats are not going to recover after 2020. Uh, <laughs> okay, bats are screwed. Let me think of a different yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How about, how about vultures, <laughs> though? How about, like, how about like a vulture? Because I, I talk about vultures a lot in my class and how like they get a bad rap because yeah. they're, they're actually wonderful birds. They're super important for our ecosystem. They're very like sociable. They're 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 great animals. They're not they like inherently <laughs> evil. It's just that they show up when stuff goes wrong, when like a lot of people die <laughs> and there's like war and stuff. Yeah, so I think like the human experience has attached a bit of fear to that because yeah. it's like, yeah. well, when my family died, vultures came out of the sky and, and you know, right. ate everybody and it's <laughs> scary. And I think like the same could be said for like venomous animals or, you know, spiders even and stuff like that there's this sort of like um you know just Stigma. response where you're like yeah you're like a little bit like oh I, maybe you know there's bright colors on it i don't know if i should touch it it might be poisonous you know it's kind of you guys, kind of goes back oh go ahead you feel that there, we have a responsibility uh to our writers and directors <laughs> when they say oh I, I want a scary bat like creature i want a scary spider like creature Right. And I feel like, you know, you got the Peter Benchley syndrome of if we perpetuate these myths mm -hmm. um, and, and these easy, low-hanging fruit tropes, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really unfair. And of course, if you say that in a meeting, it's like, who is this, not tree hugger, but bat hugger in the room here? Well, what's your concern for these animals? And I just yeah. feel like, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's important that when we do it, you hope that the writers and the creators define a creature experience in a film 
that allows people to be frightened. That's the experience that you want, but not right. do it in a cliche way. I guess that's what I'm getting at is totally yeah. learning a little bit of something. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that that's like really interesting, you know, to jump off of. And I, I mean, I agree. I just think it's one of those things that's like, you have to also be aware of what the audience, I guess, is bringing to it through their own, their own like experience and, and like their psychological. I guess, uh, yeah. And it's, it's just, I think it's just kind of interesting but, sort of. But you know, uh, like Nello was saying, the low hanging fruit. I mean, I think everyone here has been doing, doing this for a while now and you always try to do something new because you've done all right. that low hanging fruit stuff already. So you're trying to make something that's scary. Like at Marvel, what's amazing that over there is I, I don't actually get to do scary, scary monsters anymore, horror stuff. Because uh, mm -hmm. Jared takes all of that, you know. <laughs> so I do the cute stuff now. It's like, what? I'm not cute. I'm not used to this. But I got, I, I, I was fortunate I had kids, you know, my kids help me create these cute creatures because they make me feel a certain way. So the way they act or the way they look, I try to, put that in there but uh if let's say like you were saying neville if a, a bat gets a bad rap maybe i could do a bat like creature that's more alieny and more um kind of like elegant so he doesn't look like he's scary or something like that but i think we we try our best to come up with something new and and not and and still familiar you know that's like the hardest thing mm. to do but um, well, it would it would take quite a bit of guts to um, to be that moral, I suppose, or bold, I guess, um, yeah. when doing design work because, like, the bottom line is is, uh, and I, I've I've learned it more recently. Uh, you know, we're we're in such little control over what makes it on screen, and so we are we are catering to the aesthetic, the sensibilities of you know, the directors and studios. So I, I think I had this, I might've had this conversation with, with Anthony. I remember yeah. we were on, we were on a show uh, over at Marvel or whatever. And you know, I was trying to- Or well, whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no big deal. That one, that, it's just that one. Um, but, you know, we were doing, we had a big monster to figure out. And um, I was on it for a while. And then Anthony jumped on it. And of course, Anthony did these like really bizarre, incredibly brilliant things. Oh, thanks, man. And <laughs> yeah, they were great. They're great. Um, and Is it Guardians 2? Was that no, the Guardians 2? Oh. I can't say the title. You didn't do anything on Guardians 2 that I would call it. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, no. Uh, but it was, it was more recent. It was more recent. And um, I had gone. I had gone, uh, I would say, mm, cliche creative, whatever. Like I put a spin on it, but you know that was my that was my gamble. And and it's it's always a combination in my experience of what I think is cool. I'm a third, you know, what I think is cool, what the director thinks is is cool, what the studio will approve. And I'm in that box, and I'm I'm trying to solve that that problem. And um, Anthony did work that was absolutely imaginative and outside of the box and they ended up going with with what i had done because it was safer and it's always it's always that 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 gamble like you can do things that are really out there you can try to push them in um different directions but half of the challenge is actually knowing what the client wants and trying to make what they want as like creative as possible if you're super fast you can knock out a ton of cool stuff um but i find that if your your priority is to get it on screen it's that it's that space and and it, it really depends on on who you're working with i've rarely uh been in a situation where i've been able to steer them into something that was so um so outside of the box, um, you know, it's just just like uh, personal experience. Uh, but I have seen it done. Like like Neville posted, like a like a sea creature, like a like a weird like gill man. And there there, I don't think 
there were gills, but it was like alien and it was a swimming thing. And, uh, you know, I hadn't seen anything like that in a long time. And I was, I was really impressed. And so now, you know, I, I'm trying to personally get out of the box, but it's a very, it's a very tempting place to be where you, you know that, um, uh, if I, if I just make it, if I do a slightly new version of something that people are familiar with, then it'll probably get approved. So I guess thinking out loud, I'd love, I'd love to take more risks like, like Anthony and Neville. <laughs> Kind of going off the back of that, Jared, uh, Adam uh, in the chat here was kind of saying, so how do you broker design requests or input from a director or producer or, you know, whatever, whoever is kind of giving you those guidelines, kind of talking like what Bryn was saying as a kind of a starting point, but then kind of in contrast to that, actually portray and design a plausible and functional creature. You know, because sometimes, you know, they'll be like, oh, it's going to be like this, it's going to be like this, it's going to be like this. And you're like, but, you know, it actually wouldn't work like that. You know, I'm sure like Terrell with her, you know, with the science, you know, the, uh, you know, the natural history background and kind of being very familiar with animal anatomy. Like, is that ever kind of challenging when someone kind of comes to you with a creature that's so weird and so out there and you're like, but that just that wouldn't work in the real world. Like, how do you combat that? Well, it's, a... um, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's, it's that dilemma um, that Jared was mentioning that we want a creature that no one, that no one's ever seen before. Yeah. <laughs> you know, reiterating everything. But first of all, um, if, if, if it's going to work, uh, we're, we're presuming that this creature needs to be animated in some way. So it needs to have some sort of structure that can work in a physical universe that we can recognize. And most, it has to some identifiable way of communication, some sort of space, basically. Some, somewhat, either that or it's a very good gestural actor, for example, in the case of insects. Um, if they can, they can act in a very gestural way that are speaking. But yeah, um, for, my own experience often how I would get a departure creature approved is I'll do I'll put the main design, what I think the director wants, which usually even if he says I want something I've never seen before, it's usually something he has seen before. So I'll give him off that off of him something like that. But to the side I'll have a some sort of creature in the background. That's my idea. I call those duders. And I found that that works very well. Like it's like an almost like a little sidekick thing and something else going on in the background that people will actually throw in. And oh, wow, oh, that's kind of cool. And then that gets the conversation started. I just call them doodles. So do doodles. So basically, you're just like, I'm just going to do this anyways. <laughs> But but in but because you're Terrell and you're so soft spoken, you can just be like, "Well, I've done what you want, but I also I just I took this time and I've done this as well, you know." And I think yeah, because it's like, um, for example, you take a picture and you go to Africa and you see big water, this big pink bison walking around, big pink water buffalo. And they're huge and they're majestic and they do horns and uh, they're scary. And then in the background. This is like this little, um, oh, civic hat trotting around the back. Oh, let's put that in there too. Or the ox that rides on the water buffalo. Well, those ox peppers are too cute, or the horn bills, or whatever else. Um, that's a way of slipping it in there. Yeah. So, yeah. The, biggest, the biggest tool that we, anyone, would have. Uh, when you're given the task of designing something that is described in a way that makes no sense is, um, is your research um, and, and having an, a non-subjective quantifiable um, presentation ready that, that validates the choices or at least debunks what they're asking for in a respectful way referencing science as opposed to it being your opinion that well you know a floating octopus with feathers 
biologically uh, wouldn't happen. To just say that as an opinion, you can't sell um, what you're trying to sell, but to, to validate it with real stuff. And, you know, Anthony, the whole science videos, um, Discovery Channel, Planet Earth, et cetera, et cetera, my God, I learned so much from that. Yeah. That's available to anyone. It's not like I have yeah, yeah. a special part of my brain. I just I, I, went to that stuff. I do like the octopus with feathers, though. That's an interesting idea. Mm. I just thought of it. <laughs> yeah, I, just like, I, need to do, I need to do that. That sounds cool. You could probably make it work. I just, <laughs> this is the other side of the coin is if you know, maybe, I, don't, I don't think I know too much, but I know enough to stifle creativity because I would say, well, octopuses never have feathers. That'll never work. <laughs> and th that's also something you got to be careful of, too. I mm -hmm. have to be careful of yeah. is because I have such great reference, I could really um, stifle creativity. You know, Wayne Barlow, who you all know, that dude has no stifling. There's no, <laughs> there's no editing function with Wayne and his ideas. And when I worked with him on Avatar, I realized how lame I was because I was like, I was doing the obvious and Wayne would come in with these ideas. I'm like, how? Why? What's going on here? And I, and I realized something about not holding back, this unbridled, I'm, gonna, I'm not concerned about what you think of my art. Wayne is fantastic, and he really pointed something out, whether he wanted to or not, about letting go, letting go of the rules. Yeah. I think, uh, I think for students or, or up-and-coming artists that they should have a balance between the two knowing when to go crazy and knowing when it's time to do something that's familiar, really familiar, and then giving options in between so they have the whole gamut, you know, so they could choose from that. I mean, that's what we're there for. They can't, uh, the directors, producers uh, look to us to, to, to have a, a vision of what they wish, you know, wish they could imagine it out to. So, uh, but yeah, definitely those two ranges of, of, of design um, should be like balanced out, be able to do the crazy and be able to do like normal and in between. And I'd like to actually um, expand on that. Um, what advice do you guys, other advice do you guys have for people starting out wanting to design creatures? Foundation, uh, tons of, tons of anatomy studies, tons of animal uh, studies, know, drawing at the zoo. To, yeah, I'd never, never just start with um, anything more complicated than uh, drawing and painting. You have to really build a mileage, and um, yeah. it's very hard with the technology out there, um, and with all the information out at once, which is which is uh, very unique. Like when we were studying uh, to be designers, it was there was such limited information. Now there's just this barrage of of techniques and instructional videos and you know all of these different levels of finish people don't know where to begin so just learning how to draw well um, is is always step one um, everything else is an embellishment or um, uh, a rendering technique if you can if you can communicate effectively on paper then you can move on and you can you can and start embracing other programs, but um, but just build your build your design language um, there and your, your your foundation there. Do you guys have a specific animal? Let's say if a beginning student wants to do an animal that they could really learn from. Like if there's an, I'm asking the panelists if there's something that you would recommend for someone to study. Like if I would say a oh, scorpion for me, use a scorpion or octopus. Actually, octopus is my favorite. So, how about you guys? You guys have any? Well, when when I was teaching, I always studied. I always started with humans because mm -hmm. if you begin with a human, it's relatable. People can identify parts on themselves. They understand the functionality of themselves. Then you can start to cover uh, all of mammals right there because there's just there's a couple of differences between you know bipeds and, and quadrupeds you you know you pull out the uh, the collarbone you have them on all fours and you you know you rearrange the legs a little bit and you're done um but uh yeah trying to get them through 
anatomy, uh, especially before anything with like an exoskeleton, um, I think is pretty important because, you know, the, um, uh, you, you can, you can get through like a crustacean or, or an insect a lot more easily than, you know, um, something fleshy that, that squashes and stretches and flexes and, you know, so, um, yeah, personally, when I was teaching, it was always humans first, and then we, we branch out. I would suggest, I mean, I agree, um, I, I think as well, I think teaching them for schoolism, I start out with, the, with, the, with humans, because we know ourselves as humans, and usually, I am on the assumption that most people have a, some um, life drawing, etc. One of the most important animals to be able to draw well on horses. Horses, horses. in art history, they're the most um, animal that has been drawn in the most throughout history. They're a foundational animal for metals. Mm -hmm. Also, they probably have the most extreme anatomies of mammals, including dolphins and whales and birds. Even. Their limb structure is so attenuated. But at the same time, they have all the bones and muscles that we do, except for collarbones and um, about um, 16 digits, 16 toes. But they are so important. Think of all of all the animals in the human movies. Which ones appear the most? They're real animals. And every Disney princess has a horse. They're in everything. And so I would say, if you can understand human anatomy, you can understand horse anatomy, then any other animals that fall in between, you've got a handle on. That would be my advice if someone is saying, I only have so much time to understand anatomy. Understand human anatomy. Oh, yeah. Thank you. No dinosaurs? I think mine was dinosaurs. <laughs> That's what I would, but Velociraptors specifically. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yes, though, right? How about you, Bryn? I always drew big cats as a kid. Yeah. Big cats and, and horses. Um, I think that I would absolutely piggyback on the horse comment just because I feel like if there's one animal I've drawn the most in my career, it's the horse. And I think that um, cats are a really good place to look for um, mo movement. They're kind of fluid and solid all at the same time. So I, I think they're a great resource for volume, um, movement, mass, all that. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, horses definitely, horses and greyhounds, I think I use a lot for like di uh, dragons start off points. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a greyhound, I have a rescue greyhound. Either, yeah, oh, greyhounds oh. are awesome. I love their anatomy. Uh, one of the questions that's in the in the chat is um, so a lot of you guys kind of you know all in live action um, you know even though they're kind of fantasy creatures things that don't exist in real life it still has that real life quality to it um, someone was asking you know if they have a more cartoony style like do you have any ideas on, on how they could kind of incorporate that within like a traditional creature design so that, you know, if it's too cute, like how can they, you know, because cartoony can sometimes go too cute, like any thoughts on how they could? Um... Well, I, I don't necessarily think that cute is like a negative thing in creature design, because I think that cute is, you know, cute and stylized are like two different things, really. But I think that um, something that I looked at a lot as a kid, too, is like just the old Disney cartoons, because there were so many really good design choices on those animals that were very much based in like actual animal anatomy and proportion. Disney did a really good job. Like I'm thinking of like Snow White, Bambi, 101 Dalmatians, all of these kind of classic uh, animated films, even Lion King and back in, you know, into the nineties and stuff like that, um, where they were really, you could really tell where the joints were. The anatomy was there. It was just simplified and kind of, you know, elegant. So, I mean, I would, I would start there. Um, and also Kent Holgren is a good resource for that. Um, I forget the name of his book, but 
look that name up <laughs> and uh, you'll find a really great animal drawing book um, where you can find some really beautiful animals in motion that can maybe help as a jumping off point. Really about like in cartoons, it's just kind of simplifying the forms, but you got to know those forms in order to simplify them. So it all kind of stems back to observational drawing is really the foundation for that. Absolutely. As Chuck Jones famously said, if you want to draw a funny looking horse, it sure helps draw a real one. And uh, he is, that's found in say device is going to understand the natural forms in the world to oyster. You can stylize or cutify or verify or whatever find to your heart's content. So if you have <laughs> nature as your anchor, and you can you know, go on that high as a kite if you want to have that. I'm, trying, I'm just having a look through the chat to see what other um well i want to actually okay, a couple people on. have asked this question like i actually think four different ways so people really want to know have you ever designed a character that scared you and if so did it show up in your dreams and give you nightmares <laughs> <laughs> i think it's usually it gave me nightmares then i drew it That's oh that's actually another question. Are you ever inspired by your dreams? So any yeah. form of nightmares or either way. Yeah. When I wake up, I'll just try to draw it as fast as I can. Yeah. Funny. I yeah. If I ever have a nightmare there, again, it's, it's some human thing. Any, I, remember, I remember having one dream of a creature design. And uh, I remember, or it, was, it was a bit lucid, and I remember thinking about how cool it was. And then I remember waking up and drawing it and realizing it wasn't that cool. <laughs> never, I don't think I've ever been um, inspired either way. Uh, it's always been a human, right? Like for me, like a, an old man smiling or yeah. something, and everything's just so scary. <laughs> yeah, it's the long hat and. But everyone has that dream, kind of, right? No, I don't have that. No. Like, yeah, that's where Baba Good, Babadook came from, right? Everybody has that. Yeah. yeah. You know what's kind of interesting about dreams? I remember I had a dream not that long ago, and it wasn't about creatures. It was about environments and uh, architecture. And it was all new stuff. It was beautiful. And I remember when I woke up, I thought, God, that what an incredible looking dream. And, um, and that's actually mine. Those are my creations. I've never seen them before. And why I bring this up is because they were my thoughts. But if, if I tried to sit down and draw them, I couldn't. <laughs> and I find this interesting, having taught design and drawing as well, we all have an imagination. We all have the ability to think of stuff. Maybe not invent things, but we can imagine things. Something happens from the brain between your shoulder, elbow, and if you're lucky, it gets down to your wrist maybe, but for the very fortunate, it exits at the end of your pencil. And I say that because everyone has a creative imagination. It's a matter of exercising both physically and mentally a way to extract that. Um, and one of the greatest tests I give my students is, you can all try this, is to pick the person that is the most in your life, your mom, your baby, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whomever that is, the person you know so well, and without pulling up an image, draw them. Hmm. How many of you can? Almost none of us. And the reason why is because we don't pay attention. We truly, truly don't. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I mean that when you look at someone, like an artist does a likeness, they're doing the classic thing with their pencil or whatever, because they're paying attention to proportion, which is what it's all about. You're capturing the likeness of a horse versus a dog. And that is one of the things that we would need to do to be able to extract a mental image and put it on paper is to really, really, really pay attention to what it is you're imagining. And that's what I love about dreams is if you're able to remember them, how can you tap into them and use them as an actual resource? I love that. You're talking yeah. on something very interesting um, in terms of like what you see in your mind and, and how you're able to execute it. Uh, one of the biggest breakthroughs I had as a, um, 
creature designer or whatever, was that um, I decided, because, because we struggle with it all the time, at one point I could see everything I wanted to execute uh, perfectly clearly. And it would end up hurting me quite a bit because I would desperately be trying to exactly get what was uh, in my head on the page or in model or whatever. And then I, I created a rule because it was just, it was impossible that I need about 30% of the design resolved <laughs> before I start drawing or, or modeling. And then through the process of resolving it, I figure it out. But if I were to really figure the entire thing out 100% and try to execute it, I'm miserable and it just completely slows me down. So as a, uh, for years now, like my rule has been, been at the, a minimum 30% and then find it on the page or find it, find it in the stall. It's been a big help. You have like a measuring cup or a ruler to figure out this 30%? It's got to be a doodle. It's got to be a loose <laughs> doodle. And, and, you know, you have to basically understand the silhouette. So it basically has to work about yay big. Yeah. And you can, yeah. you can go to town on it because it's not going to change that much. Like, like it was another thing when you're working in Photoshop and you've got your navigator window, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and for a lot of films, it's true. Uh, the, the silhouette is for a lot of horror, especially uh, creatures, um, that creature has to work as just a silhouette. So you figure out the silhouette and you know, it's a little ballpoint pen doodle. Um, by the time you resolve it, the design doesn't change, but it takes about what, 30 seconds to figure that out, which is great for like yays or nays. And you can, you can fill a page yeah. of that and you've invested nothing. But 30% um, keeps me from going crazy. That's but, the but Jared, the great thing about horror films though, usually it's a person, so that's done already. That's your silhouette. Oh, yeah. silhouette. And then yeah. now the inside part you have to do. That's the one that takes forever. That's, that's the easy part. You don't have to use silhouette. That's the, that's the hard part. <laughs> what it looks like like that. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about um, another thing, find, trying to find that you see that image in your head and you're trying to capture it. And I, I, just, I just thought about landscape painting. You know when you do landscape painting, you don't have to get the thing exactly. It just has to be in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And for someone that, that sees it, just newly sees your painting, they won't know you didn't copy it exactly. <laughs> they'll, they'll still think it's cool. <laughs> and it looks mm -hmm. like it. So I try to do that when I'm seeing the thing, I can't quite get it. Okay, that's a triangle. Let me just put that a triangle for now. Then maybe I could try to capture the rest of it if I can. Well, well how resolved are your ideas before you start drawing and painting? Um, I don't think it's resolved really. I just try to find it as I, cause I'm trying different parts that fit and I'm, I like rhythms a lot, like uh, abstractions. So instead of silhouette, I mean, of course, silhouette's so important, but after the silhouette, uh, you find the rhythms or the abstractions, the face or other creatures or other uh, animals finding what rhythms it has and then trying to apply that onto my design and see if these other shapes I put on that silhouette follows that rhythm or the V, let's say, you know, it's something scary, you have that V, this is simpli simplifying stuff, right? Then if it fits on that hanger, uh, what do you call that? Um, a clothes hanger type thing, like putting all the shapes on top and seeing if it works that way, distribution of details and all that stuff, and it fits or not. So usually, same thing, I don't quite know everything yet and I try to think of it as a feeling first try to capture that feeling in, in the shapes and rhythms and then figure out everything later. Unless it's something that has to be familiar and I already know this because I drew it like for 20 years already. So I just use the same thing and just tweak it a little bit, you know, so that, do, that's do one way. Have, do any of you ever do like kind of thumbnails? Like Ian McCaig was always talking about that. So rather, you know, cause you guys are so, there's so, such time restraints and you know, Jared was talking about it earlier you want to, it's hard to not be tempted by wanting to just nail the design that you know that's going to get on screen, right? Mm -hmm. So you might not necessarily have the time to fully realize one whole painting because that, you know, once that gets in the meeting, they can, they can just shoot it down like immediately. You know, like, oh man, I spent two, two or three days on that. Like, 
doing those kind of, is, is that sort of a process that you would recommend to people? Like if it's not working, like, or just kind of rough it out and then kind of see if it's working and then kind of put more effort into, into the one like Terrell Brin, like, do you have any sort of, you know, cause I can see Terrell and Brin like kind of nodding being like, do you think that's an important technique? Like for people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll usually work kind of um, quick, lots of fast doodles that aren't, you know, deep finished at all just to try to get shapes out like um, Anthony's talking about with keeping things really loose and ambiguous in the beginning um, and even what uh, Jared mentioned before with 30 percent you're always just kind of going quickly just to see if there's anything that sticks out um, and if you have a collaborative team or director that is interested in seeing the process I mean I've been on other projects where they're they're very much interested in sitting through that and so they kind of want to watch while you go and talk about it as you draw. So it kind of depends, um, but absolutely thumbnailing is really important because it can kind of just help get it all out and then you're not so worried about making it right. You explore more. And I've even yeah. found, sorry, I don't mean to trail, but I've even found working on them in like a permanent medium, like just a pen, like an ink pen or something, just so I'm not erasing or pushing undo mm -hmm. too much, just so that way it's like pure, um, I'm not worried about messing emotion. up. I'm just going. Yeah, it's just yeah, like pure okay, emotion. Just, yeah, yeah. I'm just drawing. You know, it's not. I'm not going to yeah. sit there and fiddle along it. I can just kind of get stuff out. So, absolutely. Um, I have had the Casey paper because Casey paper, or even mine, you can use mine. Yeah, paper. You, you don't have to worry about. Oh, it's Christine. It's mine. You know? Yeah. You're like using paper, right? And it's expensive paper, and it's my mess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, or even post that I would just, you know, you could have, like, here's like a little little pencil and here's a, like a ball pen, you know, just, and I, I won't pull it in a depth, I'll just pull it at the end. Like, you need to be, you need to be. And I'm usually thinking about what does this creature live? If it's what I'm doing, where does it live? Because the environment, even if it's a magical world, has a lot to do with what this creature will eventually look like. It. And you can, you can get a whole bunch of noodles out there. And you often, it's only I can tell what they are. <laughs> it's so abstract. Um, but I mean, that is a lot of Here's something. Oh, yeah. This is like about a really, really good <laughs> noodle here. This is like a two head tissue for you can just for fun. Awesome. Yeah. And I started really small. I just like I just it. It took me like about two seconds to with my little my little pencil. It held at the end. The um, it's cool to see um that you guys are still you like you get the opportunity to use traditional because like with so many you know, uh, Justin was asking earlier about like all the different software that's available to you guys now. Um, you know, sometimes I'm sure it can get kind of messy when you're trying to be like, oh man, do I need to learn this and this and this, you know, like how many of you guys use 3D? Like, I know that Jared uses 3D, Neville did. I'm right. starting to um, incorporate it more. If, is that because it's something that you know because I feel like artists in general they 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 want to grow and they always want to continue to learn the craft is that something that's kind of coming from from your own desires or are you feeling that there's a need in the industry to to know 3d now well, um, both. I mean, yeah well creep, creep design has a history of being dimensional um like there have been maquettes done for complicated you know uh creature designs forever so it's it's been a a three-dimensional thing yeah for a very long yeah. time if you were to look at like stan winston's rick baker's yeah so it's not yeah. at all dissimilar to working um with zbrush because if there are a lot of things people can turn around in their mind very easily you know like like costumes for the most part you do a costume from the front people will know what it looks like from back any human figure or whatever even recognize like a unicorn maybe you know you probably don't have to do a model of a unicorn but if it's a bizarre thing then a rough sculpt um, is within the tradition of, of doing creature design within the industry, considering how many 
maquettes were done back in the day just out of like Chavant and, and you know oil-based clays and water clays and all that fun stuff. Do you think that's why we got into the 3D stuff much faster because of being in the creature shops we already like sculpting that's why you already just went ahead and did it. Yeah uh, and it was I, hate, I hate to say it but I actually think it's so much easier um, to get something to read dimensionally than it is on on paper as in terms of the development of an artist line is such an abstraction the responsibility that you have on paper far outweighs the responsibility you have with with clay simply because you already have light form dimension you get good at pushing a medium around you don't have to worry about perspective or anything like that so um mm -hmm. it's it, it's a very natural process whereas when you can draw everything, you really earn that and you have to do that every single day because you lose that really fast. Um, so in terms of, you know, 3D and, 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 and creatures, it, it does have definitely its history. Um, it's definitely, I would say, slower um, than, you know, like, like Terrell could knock out like 50 in the amount of time it would take me to do maybe three that are like half resolved <laughs> like like it's but but again you're designing for but now you uh, could do like in one day you could finish one pretty resolved in like two days with your stuff now with your level oh, now. You see me. yeah that's true but again like mckay terrell <laughs> you know yeah, like, yeah. fast fast ideas it's, just yeah it's much it, quicker it depends on who you're working for and i've rarely worked for uh, that many clients that can actually uh, read line work um, because there's so much going on uh, and, and there, there are all of these very resolved designs being done. I think it perhaps spoiled clients and, and you know, you can't get a sketch through with some people um, internally though. It's great. Like if you're working with a production designer, art director, whatever, you can give them a doodle and I, I do it all the time. Um, I will, I will do a drawing I'm not proud of and, and will never show. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say, hey, how about this or this? I'll do like three or four. And then, you know, um, I'll get the green light on a couple of sketches and then I'll start sculpting. Uh, but it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's the most, it is the most efficient way to work if your clients are detail oriented, but it will, it will slow down the design process. Since we're almost at time, um, I just wanted to, in closing, ask each of you, starting with Bryn, what is one simple piece of advice that you have for someone wanting to either excel in the industry or get into the industry? Um, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> uh, be kind and, um, you know, reach out and um, make genuine friendships you know with people i mean everybody he here and beyond i've had the pleasure of working with and being part of within the industry is have always really encouraged me and it's really important to have that community um so draw a lot and play nice <laughs> no yeah all right um be patient with yourself in both the process of learning and and doing and uh, be prepared and embrace failure um, it is how we grow it is how we learn um, th those two things i find vital not just getting uh, into an industry but continuing into the work that uh, i do and we all do it's about being patient with yourself and being uh, willing to make mistakes and fail it's the only way to get better i think with me um i i share the same advice that they give like be kind be patient with yourself also be genuine with what you want to do and not have to you know shape yourself for what you think they want it, just do what you feel you enjoy and I think the money will come if that's what everyone's worried about getting work, right? But if you enjoy the subject matter you're painting, uh, you, you'll put more time into it and then your designs will be better, I think. So yeah, be true to yourself. Terrell? <laughs> um, probably what you 
the most important thing is to realize and it just goes to mind with what everybody else has been saying. There's no such thing as perfection. Absolutely no such thing as perfection if you are a member of the human race. And um, excellence is possible. Excellence is possible, but perfection, that's impossible. I mean, regardless of what you believe philosophically, one thing that has always helped me is that to say there's only one God and I'm not him. So excellence, yes, you can work towards that. Perfection, that's, that just kills creativity, kills learning, and you never ever ever get that. Find it perfect. Well, it can be good. It can be excellent. It can be good. What's that, Jared? Uh, well, um, everybody touched on so many amazing points. I would say, uh, in in just practical terms of, of getting through, um, uh, have a solid plan, look at the uh, studios and, and the kind of work that you specifically want to do and uh, build a solid portfolio based on that. And you can do that by contacting those, those studios, whether they're game companies or visual effects houses, finding out what they're specifically looking for and building a portfolio around that. Yeah, Great. And sending it in. Don't be afraid. Just send it in. Yeah. <laughs> Just get rejected, like Neville said, as many times as you can. So you yeah. figure out, engage where you are. You know, so, don't be so scared. You can get in touch with anyone nowadays. And the funny thing is, like people get in touch with me a lot, and people have been very generous with me in the past. So I always, I usually respond. I, I think I always respond. Um, but if you're going to get in touch with, you know, a working professional, at the very least. Uh, have a portfolio or something uh, out there that you can direct them to. So mm. first and foremost, yeah, have an art station page, have a blog and, um, you know, see how good you are and be honest with yourself. Mm. Challenge yourself every day. And something that really inspires me about you guys as well, and I'm sorry, Bryn and Terrell, I don't know about this, about you guys personally, um, but with Neville, Jared and Anthony, I know you guys are also pursuing being a director and like different parts of your craft, like you're always expanding out to different parts. Like, do you feel that as you learn those other parts that actually helps you as an artist or how does that, or do you, I guess, um, how do you feel that that's kind of furthered your craft? I feel like I realize I'm always a storyteller. I just love stories. And that's why I do the art to tell the stories and the creatures that I do to tell the story. And I never really thought of, trying to like uh and i guess i always wanted to be a director even before but uh i was better at concept art and i forgot about the directing and just recently started putting together my stuff for pitch packages and you know my own shows and stuff like that and it's inspired me to do more and just this uh energy of of, of just uh, more new stuff to be creative with i think it it helps uh my positive energy I think that's what. Thank you. Yeah, it does. Jared Neville, you don't have to answer. I just really wanted no, to point out that I'm impressed. I've by talked it. a lot. So I, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. Neville. I mean, concept art, the storytellers in general. I mean, I feel like mm -hmm. that's kind of, you know, I've had conversations with my husband before, and he's an artist. And I'm, you know, he, he doesn't consider himself an artist like first. Like he's, you know, it's, it's all about the story and character creation and, and, and stuff like that. And I think building worlds, you know, yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I the realize. Art, you know, art is kind of like the medium of how you're able to convey that. Right. But I think so many like really great, great concept artists and designers are um, really good with story. Um, but yeah, to begin with, you know. Well, and, and how I met Neville, we were at an event um, and we were both speakers and Neville, you, you're ta if you guys ever have the chance to see Neville talk in person, please go like when the world returns to normal, because he, it's just, it's an, it's an art talk, but it's also, it's, it's, it's an experience and a performance. Like you are a storyteller. That's just who you, you are. So I love, so anyway, it's not to step on. I'm on stage though, that's for sure. That's an experience. No. 
But um, but have you been enjoying directing stuff as well, or is it a different part of you? I think much like Anthony's answer, it's I, I'm discovering it is the part that I'm supposed to be in a way. Yeah, always craved telling the stories. What I found in the process of design uh, for film specifically is being so. Um, close to the process, sitting next to the director on set, working in the makeup trailers, working with the actors. Uh, it has given me an opportunity to, uh, unbeknownst to me at the time, learn so much about the entire orchestra um, of, of creating this amazing piece of art, which is film. And that I find, you obviously cannot do it all, but knowing at the very least the language um, and the needs of the other arts, the other crafts, which includes uh, food service, which includes um, grip. You know, it's not just about artists and actors and lights, it's everything. Uh, that has been probably the most valuable uh, experience of being a designer in film, and I love it. I love all facets of, of filmmaking. And Jared, I don't know if you guys know this about Jared, but he does the 48 hour film festival um, with his family every year. And this year that included with a very new newborn. Um, so like, I love that. And did you direct that, that piece you guys just did? Yeah, uh, wrote and directed uh, with, with, the, with the family. And uh, it's, really, it's really a fun thing to do just to uh, stay sharp and, and you know, crank something out in a short amount of time. My wife does it more often than I do. Um, and, and you know, she's amazing and, and, uh, and she starred in this, this last thing that we did. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal exercise to um, just say, I have this limited amount of time, I'm going to tell a story and be able to just execute it. It's incredibly challenging. I done, I did a short film uh, that was, you know, 22 minutes and, uh, you know, that was just such an ordeal in comparison. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're two short uh, stories. So you can either do it with, you know, a budget that you've saved up for for a while or, you know, uh, some simple camera equipment and some very accommodating, wonderful family members. Uh, but f filmmaking in general, I think every designer should try it um, because it does give you a more well-rounded understanding of contributing to a project as a designer. And it, it's made me uh, a more understanding designer. It's made me, um, it, it's made me just more aware of, of the, the process and, and it's actually made me a bit more patient. Uh, storytelling in general is such an amazing challenge. And as designers, we're responsible for just these small pieces you know, a character which, you know, might run across the screen or might take up, you know, uh, a bit of it. And your job is always, you know, how is what you're designing uh, supports the story. So being able to tell stories, I think, um, makes you better at being able to support them on the job as a, as a concept artist. So I recommend that everybody try screenwriting, try, shoot. you could shoot something on your iPhone, like you don't even need an expensive, uh, you know. It teaches setup. you how to deal with people and teamwork. Like Neville was saying, yeah. I, I learned how to work with writers and how to guide the writers I work with, you know, to what I want or if they find my voice or if it's easy for me to explain stuff. You know, I'm still new to it. So Neville was probably, you, you got to, do, you guys already got to direct your film. When I was going to start mine, COVID happened <laughs> and, uh, you know, can't do it. So. Yet, you can't do it yet. Yet, yes, can't do it yet. So one I'll just add storyboard. Yeah, we'll all be back in person one day. One day. <laughs> soon. <laughs> one day soon. One day soon. <laughs> but it's yeah. it's like we're Maybe gonna two. connect with people that we haven't, you know, it's forced us to make connections that we wouldn't have necessarily yeah. made beforehand. So like, I don't know that if I would have met any of you. I mean, I know two of you, Nicole, yeah. as include, well, not included in that, but. Um, yeah, this is so nice. You know, thanks know, for inviting I know. me. I love this. Funny. Yeah, I've we're never... really overrunning and we're just yeah. having a chat and hanging out now. So, um, but, and yeah, and we should, we obviously want to be respectful for all of you guys. So, you yeah. guys come um, back and talk yeah. to us later. But thank <laughs> you so much. Um, it's been wonderful seeing all of you. I wish you well and hope that you stay safe in these interesting times. Right. It's great meeting everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank, Bye, you. Everyone. Thank you again.
Thanks. Okay.